day. Um, but it was, sure was a nice day to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> just like, I'm not gonna lie. It was a jam day, which was good, so good. Sorry to interrupt you on your Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Lord, everybody needs a day off. Um, yeah, so here we are. Uh, next week, well, not next week, Sunday, is the start of the Advent season, and I, 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 don't know, I love Advent, which is the, um, it means arrival or uh, appearing or coming into place, and, and Advent, there's the four Sundays before Advent, and it ends on Christmas Eve, and, and what it really does is it prepares our hearts um, Advent, there's two Advents. There's um, the first and second coming. So the first is his incarnation, which we celebrate Christmas, which means Jesus coming into the world. And then the second Advent is going to be as we anticipate Christ's return, that will be the second Advent. And so leading up to that, though, um, there's a lot that happens to get there, right, before Jesus is born. And so tonight we're going to be in Luke 1, starting at verse 57. We're going to talk about the birth of John the Baptist. But before we do that, I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you so much for this space um, that in just a couple of days we get to celebrate Thanksgiving. And um, the beautiful thing about Thanksgiving is it really turns our hearts towards what we have to be thankful for. And so um, as we... Do whatever it is that we do on that day and spend time with whomever we spend time with or maybe we're even going to be alone it's may our hearts just turn towards you and may we recognize just the many many blessings that you've bestowed upon us but for now lord as we open your word we pray that you cultivate our hearts you plant seeds there and that we'd be receptive to whatever leaps off the page of scripture tonight and we pray these, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before we get to verse 57, uh, Luke 1 is, uh, the, they, there's the birth of John the Baptist is foretold. So Zechariah, who we're going to talk about here shortly, he, was, he is a priest. And he is, in um, verse 8, it says that Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God. He was chosen by a lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and tells him, now mind you, Zechariah, he's an old dude and his wife is old and um, they don't have any children because she couldn't have any children. And Zechariah sees this angel and he's startled and he's gripped with fear. It's interesting to me that throughout scripture when somebody comes face to face with an angel that, that they're afraid. Um, I believe it's a holy fear. And the angel says to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. And then there's this prophecy that he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. And many of the people of Israel will bring, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready people prepared for the Lord. And so essentially they're saying, okay, so your wife's barren, but you're going to have a kid and this kid is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And they're waiting for the Messiah. And Zechariah says, how can you be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is along in, year, in years. And the angel is like, come on, dude. Um, I'm the angel Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you. And so now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day that this happens. Because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. And then you fast forward a little bit. Elizabeth is pregnant. And then Mary, the angel comes to Mary. And Mary and Elizabeth, their family, and um, 
Mary hears from the, the angel as well, and she says she's greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And, and the angel says to her, you will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. You see these parallels that are happening here with, with John and then now with Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. So Mary goes and she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting. And when, Mary, when she hears Mary, um, the baby leaps in her womb, and then Elizabeth knows that something's pretty special here. And she says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Lord should come to me? So immediately she knew that Mary was carrying the Messiah. And you got to kind of wonder, you know, you've got her son John, and then is preparing the way for the Messiah, which is now Jesus. So Mary breaks out in song, which is called the, um, is talked about in verse 46. And then here we are in verse 57. That was a long way to but we, we made it. That was the Reader's Digest version. And so now, let's see, as, I don't, are you all too old for Paul Harvey? I, I remember Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. I love listening to him. You guys are too young for Paul Harvey, I know that. Um, so now we're going to get to the rest of the story. Oh, thank you, Lord. Verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, he came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what his what he would like to name it. It's interesting that they made signs to him. You know, he's deaf, or, or not, I mean, mute, he can't speak, but he, it, it doesn't say anywhere in text that he's deaf. So I don't know if they just thought, you know, that they needed to, like, um, I think he could probably hear him. Like, my grandpa, uh, this is a total rabbit trail, but my grandpa got hearing aids, I don't know, when I was probably about, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, and he would pretend like he couldn't hear anything, but he, like, he could hear stuff like two rooms away. If you said something, he'd be like, I heard that. Anyway, um, that's a total rabbit trail. He asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And his father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And you know, he, he, had, a, he had a few months to think about this, too. Um, not being able to speak. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, so he goes from talking to the, to the people and talking about what God was doing, now he's talking to, to his, about his son. You will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of your God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I think what I love about this time of year is 
it, it, pretty much there's Christmas decorations everywhere. I think like Hobby Lobby had them out like two months ago. And, it, and, and but there's this, yeah, there's the material side of Christmas, but then there's also the aspect of it where it gives us as believers the opportunity to focus on Jesus. And we know that where there is Christ, there is peace. And, and I know that from my own life, and I hope that you've experienced that. And if you have not experienced that, then may that be so for you. But if we, we await for, our, for Jesus to return, to restore the mess. And we live in a mess at times. And I think we all are waiting for something. Um, and we wait on God. Like, how often does it say in Scripture, be still and know that I am God? Like, be still and know, be still and know, and just like, wait, wait, wait. And sometimes we don't like to hear wait, we don't like to wait. We live in a culture of just having a conversation with somebody over the last couple of days. We are just this, we want, like, the fast food Jesus to wear. And if you ever be in the line at, like, you know, I was at Chick-fil-A today. I do the curbside pickup, so I don't have to deal with the line. But you ever get in a line at a fast food restaurant and then, heaven forbid, you have to wait more than three minutes? You're like, all oh, getting all angry when, um, I remember the good old days before McDonald's where you actually had to go into a restaurant and sit down and wait for your food to cook. Mm -hmm. We don't like to wait. We're just, we're entitled little brats. And it's, so, um, but yet, there's something sacred about the waiting. There's something that God does in the waiting. He works on our hearts. He works on our minds. And here we have Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they're about to give birth to the one who is going to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare for what they have been waiting for for centuries. And like I said earlier, the birth of the, the, this John and, and Jesus, like there's this intertwining that happens to them with the two of them from the beginning. And the, uh, for example, the angel foretells the birth of John to Zechariah, and then he tells uh, about Jesus to Mary. He tells the pregnant Mary, um, she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's child leaps in her womb when Mary greets her. So there's their, their meeting before they're even born. Um, Mary then sings a song of praise, which is commonly known as the um, Magnificat. And Zechariah's, uh, when he does his joyful prophecy, it's known as the Benedictus in uh, verses 67 through 79. And John grows strong, and Jesus is then born, and, and it says... Um, in chapter 2, that Jesus is born and he grew in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. And then John goes out into the country, into the Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And he's calling people to produce fruit and to keep with this repentance. And, and then he baptizes Jesus. And then Jesus, he um, calls people to repent. So there, there's, there's this commonality between the two of them. So in verse 57, um, when it was time for Elizabeth to have the baby, she gave birth to a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. So up until this point, we hadn't heard anything um, from about Zechariah, because when he heard about what was going to happen, he, he did his job, and then he went home. And we don't hear about him again until it's time for him to speak. And so he had a lot of time to wait and to think. And can you imagine, like, seeing an angel and having this miracle happen before you and then not being able to tell anybody about it? Like, that, had to just, that was just crazy. On the eighth day, then, they come together to circumcise the child. And, um, and circumcision in, in those days, like, God had commanded, he had commanded Abraham and Moses to circumcise male babies when they were eight years old. And so what we can see from this, with John's circumcision, it really shows that Zechariah and Elizabeth are faithful to the observance of Jewish law. That, and which would make sense because he's a priest, right? And they, they decide, they decide, um, they're talking about what they're going to name him, and people want to name him Zechariah. And, and names are important in that culture because your name says something about your character. It's an expression of your faith. 
in the, the name John that the angel um, said for him to name him, John in Hebrew actually means Yahweh is gracious. Um, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord is gracious. So the angel is saying, name your baby, Yahweh is gracious, because God is gracious. He's, he's giving you this gift, which, which is a miracle in and of itself. And Zechariah, he's a faithful guy, and, and he, they, um, they named the baby John. And I think Zechariah's first words when he speaks, like we know he's a, faith, he's, he's a man of faith because in the beginning of Luke, in verse 6, it says that uh, both him and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of the God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. So this was, a, these were good people. And then in verse 67, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. And being filled with the Holy Spirit implies, I think, that he was equipped in a way to, to carry out this service that, um, that they were asking of him to carry out. And I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm totally forgetting to say something. But it does tell us in Scripture, too, that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it tells us that Zach, you know, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth was, and then John himself is filled with the Holy Spirit. And I love how in verse 76, he, he, he blesses the child. And I think right before that, he's actually praising God for the things that God has done. And then he shifts to say, this is what the Lord has done, but this is what my son, this is, this is what is going to happen through your life. And there's power in the tongue, in the words that we speak over our children, in the words that we speak over other people. And, and we really should be life givers. And so he says, and for you, my child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Man, what if we spoke that way over our kids and our grandkids? What a different world we would live in. Um, so Zachariah had been praising God for what God had done, and now he's praising God for the things that he's going to do in his son's life. And I think that Luke really makes it clear here that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. And that's important because they have been waiting for centuries for this to happen. John is preparing the way. For this to happen and in fact in chapter 3 Luke makes it clear that it's a fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah in verse 3 chapter 3 verse 4 he says as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make his path straight and then Jesus in chapter 7 also makes it clear that John was a was the fulfillment of that same prophecy. So the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, and I think it's interesting that the child grew and became strong and he lived in the wilderness. These Israelites, are they are wilderness people. They had, a, they had a special relationship with the wilderness. So when we think wilderness, we maybe think trees, Allegan State game area. This is not the Allegan State game area here. This, this was desert land. It was barren land. And he, in it was in the desert and in the wilderness that God had tested the people, and it was in the wilderness that God's people rebelled. It was in the wilderness where God formed and shaped these folks, and it was in the wilderness where he saved them again and again and again. And so I think it's really interesting that that's where John resided until it was his time to come forth and, and to usher in um, to make the way for Jesus. And so it's in the crucible, though, of the wilderness, too, where I think that God meets a lot of us. 
We are wilderness people. We're people who are seeking the promised land. Who doesn't want the promised land? There's a lot of promises in scripture, and I think, yes, Lord, please, Lord. I, I want that. But we don't want the wandering, and we don't want the waiting, and, and I mean, who does, Jim? Right? Not, not this girl, I'll tell you that. But it's we in the- We are people of instant gratification. We are people of instant gratification. And I really think it's in our wilderness moments where God saves us again and again and again. And that's where we, like the, this, that wilderness was the crucible of where these people became a nation. And it's in those spaces too where we learn to be good parents. We learn to be husbands and wives and we learn to care for other people and we learn that there, there's more to life than just what we want. And we're all searching for something. And we're all yearning for something. And it's in that wilderness, too, where they repented and their relationship with God was restored over and over and over again. And as we search for what our promised land might look like or what we think it should look like, I can tell you as I stand here today, life does take some wonky twists and turns. And God will hit you out of left field. And there's a lot of really good surprises that happen a lot of the way. And there's some mess, too. Each and every one of us here in this room probably have some mess in our lives. And we're all searching for something. And this is the, the beauty of it is that while we're, when we are believers in Jesus, that what it is that we're searching for, like, What's that noise? Someone's doing the Oh, kids! <laughs> is that the angel of the Lord? <laughs> what is that? Gabriel, where are you? Okay, okay. I got it. Okay. <laughs> what is going on here? Okay, no, that's good. Well, praise God, they're making they're making a joyful noise too. That's good. Anywho, back on track, take two. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this today as I was driving home because I got to spend a couple of days in Traverse City with, with some friends and um, really just enjoying some, some time alone, really. And we are, we're all uh, in the midst of it. I just think, you know, Lord, if you are a believer in Jesus and you have been washed as white as snow, because there's snow everywhere, you are a believer, honey. You are, Charlie. Like, we have been set free. But yet we 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 don't live that way. I don't always live that way. Sometimes I have this woe is me kind of attitude, and, and I think if if we truly have been set free, then why, why is it so hard for us to turn towards God and just receive that freedom and to live in that freedom and to live each day like, okay, Lord, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. Give me this day my daily bread. Give me what you have for me in this moment. And tomorrow's going to take care of itself. And, pardon? We are kind of spoiled, aren't we? And if we have the Holy Spirit residing within us, then that's, that's freedom. That's freedom. Because where, where the Holy Spirit is not, there's bondage, and there's pain, and there's pride, and there's bad attitudes, and there's anxiety, and depression. And, and so my hope for us as we go through the next four weeks of Advent and as we turn our hearts towards the birth of our Savior and um, to re not, you know, I don't even know how to really say this, like to remember the birth of our Savior. It's not like we're having a 
because the fact that we remember and we're people who remember, um, that means that God didn't forget about us. And that into the midst of, of the chaos that he sent his one and only son to die so that we might live. And so as we go through the next, um, hi, as we go through the next four weeks, I know, honey, I'm okay. All is well. As we go through the next four weeks together, I just hope that, that there will be something that will stir within us, this recognition of the fact that God so loved us that he gave his one and only son so that we could live. And then may we be people who live into that. And, and I hope that it impacts us in mighty, mighty ways. Does that make sense? I, I know. You know, she was with uh, my daughter for the last couple of days, and I picked him up this afternoon. And so they're like, please do not leave us again, mother. Well, I think this one's pretty cold. Yeah. If you, if you scratch that one, you're good. Yeah. I know. I know. All right. So, John, do you want to come up? Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Thank you for the stories that we can read about in scripture. And they're not just stories, but the, it's the reality of the fact that you prepare the way. You prepare the way for, um, for each of us. So I pray, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you plant, and I believe it's already planted, but you water and fertilize whatever it is the calling that you have on our heart use us to be people who speak life into situations to be people who bring light everywhere that we go may we be people who encourage and not tear down Lord, we pray for our families and as we gather for thanksgiving or wherever it is that we may go um, again May we be thankful and have thankful hearts as we, um, as we remember how you have been faithful to us. Remind us of when you have showed up when we least expected it. Remind us of when we were sitting in the darkness or we were in the lowest of valleys that you were still there. Remind us that you are working in the, that in the shadows and that you are working and you are Romans 8, 28, God, who uses all things for the good of those who love him. Lord, that you are using every single piece of our lives, every, every mistake, every harm that someone has done to us, that you use those things for your glory. And so, Lord, may our stories bring you glory. Lord, we praise you for those who are fighting every single day to stay clean, who are fighting the demons of addiction. Lord, we pray that you break the bondage of addiction on those who are struggling. You send your spirit to intercede into those places and you push back the darkness and that you just give them a heavenly hug and let them know, I got this. We thank you for the courage that it takes to walk in freedom. May we not lose sight of it, but also may we be reminded that we don't do it alone because you journey along with us, so we don't have to carry the load. We just praise you and thank you for the gift of this night. Bless us as we travel home with traveling mercies. And Lord, we love you and we thank you once again for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So as you leave this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may he turn his face towards you and just bless you with peace. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I think your daughter's happy to be with you. <laughs> yeah, look at her. She's smiling. You're a good girl. She's done. She's done. She's with us. Go home and get dinner.